All right. Okay, well, first of all, to start, what I'm going to do is, once again, I'm going to put that electronegativity scale up on the board. Because, once again, that's very useful in understanding chemical bonds and their properties and what kind of chemical bonds form from what elements and so on. So let's put that scale up again. Once again, it's a very important scale, just knowing the relative positions of things. So here we have high electronegativity here, low down here, and let's put a couple important elements here. Potassium way down the low end, sodium, calcium's quite low, magnesium. These, of course, form a lot of ions that are common and very important in cells and biochemistry. And then close together, once again, I don't recall exactly where, you have carbon and hydrogen. I don't know quite which is the exact order, but they are very, very close together. That's actually quite important, too. And then we have things like sulfur is a little bit electronegative. Nitrogen is fairly electronegative. Phosphorus is a little bit, but not too much. Oh, okay, and then we have very electronegative. It's oxygen, second only to fluorine, which is the most electronegative element around. And chlorine is kind of a little bit less so than oxygen. Once again, the general trends, as you go to more numbers of electrons in that valence shell, like from one to seven, you get more electronegative. But the other things, the further down in the column of the periodic table, in other words, the larger atomic weight of the element, you get less electronegative because now those valence electrons are far away from the nucleus and they're shielded by more and more layers of inner electron shells. So, yeah, it's a combination, the, the scale is a combination of those two factors. Okay, well, we mentioned before, what happens when you take stuff approximately over here, that are at opposite ends of the electronegativity scale, where you got very weakly electronegative elements, and you got very powerful over here, and very strongly electronegative elements. That's where we get the ionic bonds. And once again, an ionic bond is where the electronegative element simply tears a valence electron off of the weakly electronegative element. So, for instance, sodium loses that electron to chlorine. Now you have a chloride ion and you have a sodium ion. In this case, both of those elements now have filled electron shells, but because of the chlorine having an extra electron, the stolen one, it's got a negative charge. The sodium having its single valence electron ripped off by the chlorine has a positive charge, and then the two stick fairly tightly together to form sodium chloride. And once again, ionic bonds are moderately strong, but surprisingly, we'll see this later, water can actually tear them apart. That's how ionically bonded molecules dissolve in water. The water literally rips the ionic bonds apart, so now you have a solution of sodium ions and chloride ions separate from each other. So I must tell you that water has got some really weird properties, and we will see that later on. Okay, those are ionic bonds. But let's suppose we have atoms that are fairly close together in how electronegative they are. And we'll use carbon and hydrogen as an example. Neither of them <coughs> is capable of tearing electrons off the other. It's an even match. They duke it out. Nobody wins. So, if they want filled electron shells, they have to come up with another way of doing it. And that second way of doing it is what we call a covalent bond. And that basically means that you're going to share pairs of electrons, pairs of valence electrons, between the elements involved in that. So let's put that down. Okay. Now, basically, it's if I can't steal from you, and you can't steal from me, 
Maybe we can cooperate instead of beating the daylights out of each other. Maybe we can cooperate and say, hey, I'll give you my thing that you want half the time if you give me what I want half the time. And we just have this even sharing arrangement. And if you represent that in valent, I'm, I'm going to ignore the inner shells. Don't worry about that. We'll forget the inner shells at this point. Okay, here we have carbon. Okay, now carbon's got four valence electrons in that out in that valence shell here. Here we go. Hydrogen has a single valence electron. Like so. Now let's suppose that we decide that we're going to that the carbon will share one of its electrons with this hydrogen if the hydrogen does the same and do that with all the other four. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put pairs of electrons in between these guys. So this is one shared pair of electrons, this is another, this is a third, and this is a fourth. And of course this molecule here is methane, natural gas. And generally, we represent a covalent bond. This is a classic chemical term uh, notation. A covalent bond is represented as a line from one element to the next. And that one line represents you have shared a single pair of electrons between them. So to make methane, you have like so. And each of these lines represents a pair of shared electrons. Now let's look at another covalently bonded molecule, oxygen. Oxygen is extremely electronegative. It wants to take somebody else's electrons. And it needs just two more electrons to fill its outer shell. Now suppose another oxygen comes along. Well, even though they're Oxygen is very electronegative. It's a completely even match. Nobody's more of their exactly as electronegative as the other one is. So they have to make covalent bonds. In this case, they're going to share not just one, but two pairs of electrons between them to make a double covalent bond. So I'm going to put oxygen over here. And what we're going to do is share two pairs of electrons. So part of the time this oxygen has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Part of the time this oxygen has eight electrons, a filled shell, and another part of the time this one has it. So in a sense, it kind of oscillates back and forth. So in both cases, everybody gets at least part of the time a filled electron shell. And then the other part of the time, they're actually giving their electrons to the other guy. So in this case, with oxygen, we have two covalent bonds, two pairs of shared electrons. So oxygen gas is represented like this. It's even possible to make three covalent bonds, nitrogen being a good example of that. Now nitrogen gas, nitrogen atoms need three electrons to fill their outer shell. If they combine with another nitrogen atom, they can share three pairs of electrons between them. So we have a triple covalent bond in this case. And that's nitrogen gas. Now, nitrogen is fairly electronegative, and nitrogen is fairly reactive. And think of this, the vast majority of explosives have nitrogen, are nitrogen rich molecules. Think of TNT, trinitrotoluene, uh, uh, nitroglycerin, and all those fancy military explosives and stuff. And even the stuff that the guys in Boston like to use, but it's ordinary gunpowder, potassium or sodium nitrate. So nitrogen is fairly reactive, but when you combine the two, when you join two nitrogen atoms together to make nitrogen gas, that's a very stable, unreactive kind of molecule. That's one reason why you can use nitrogen to store things for long periods of time. Have you ever gone down to the supermarket and got those packages of food that are at room temperature and 
All you have to do is open up the package and warm it up, and those things are stable for like a year or more. They still taste good. How do they do that stuff? Well, they prepare the stuff, and then they flash pasteurize it, and they pack in this multi-layered kind of plastic, aluminum, all kinds of stuff, and fill it up with nitrogen. Because if you had oxygen in there, what would happen is the oxygen would react with the fats and everything would go rancid and taste terrible. On the other hand, you store it under nitrogen, and you do that with all kinds of biological molecules that are very sensitive to oxidation. You store it under nitrogen. Because nitrogen gas is very, very stable and very unreactive. Okay, so those are examples. You have single covalent bonds, double, even triple covalent bonds. All right, so there are some examples of covalent bonds. Now, covalent bonds are also strong bonds. They're the strongest bonds we know of. Typical bond strains, we mentioned ionic bonds are about, say, 30 or 40 kilocalories per mole. Once again, I forgot whether you convert up or down for kilojoules per mole. But uh, typical covalent bonds, you're talking about 100 or so kilocalories per mole. That's about twice as powerful, more than twice as powerful as a typical ionic bond. Now, of course, it varies from one covalent bond to the next, but covalent bonds typically are much stronger than ionic bonds. In fact, some of the strongest covalent bonds can hold together in the atmosphere of the sun. At 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, there are a couple molecules, not just elements, but molecules in the solar atmosphere. Now, not very many things can hold together at that kind of heat. And think of carbon. Carbon makes covalent bonds with other carbons. What did, when they used to have the space shuttle, what did they use to, at the areas of the shuttle, they exposed the worst reentry heat, like the nose cap and the leading edge of the wings? They used stuff that was carbon filaments matted together. The carbon could take the searing temperatures of reentry, as long as foam didn't blow holes in it, and it could still come through. So they used carbon. Even steel would have melted at those kind of temperatures. But the carbon could hold up. The original light bulbs were made of carbon filaments. Now they use tungsten, which is a metal that has the highest melting point of any metal we know, any substance we know of. But, now, but the original light bulbs, the ones that Edison first made, had carbon filaments. And you ran electricity through it and heated it up until it glowed. And you had to do it in a vacuum, otherwise at night. That's why your typical regular light bulbs are in a vacuum, you break the bulb and implodes on you and stuff. Okay, so covalent bonds can be very, very strong bonds. They're the strongest bonds we know. Now, how do you, when, where do you make covalent bonds? You make covalent bonds between elements that are more similar to each other in how electronegative they are. They're similar enough that neither party can take electrons, can just steal electrons from the other side. So, Roughly, if you want a region where you find covalent bonds, we can say we have a region around here where these things make covalent bonds with each other. And another region that's kind of more around here where we can get covalent bonds. Okay. And if you go way, way far apart at the extreme ends of the electronegativity scale, that's when you get ionic bonds, where one is so electronegative it can actually steal electrons from the other.